far too heavy to fit in a backpack. Fortunately, I found an FT817. Uh, YT817, you hear a lot of cheers, great little radio. There were other manufacturers of the same thing. As it turned out, I wanted to buy it with only a couple of weeks remaining before I left. And uh, these were the only two available. A company in Brisbane called Ozgear. And the man of the moment uh, that was looking after Ozgear at the time, or owned Ozgear at the time, he came up to me today uh, and reminded me that I bought the radios from him <laughs> way back 10 years ago. And that's the little fellow there. You can give it, get an idea of the size sitting on the rubbish bin. And that's a, uh, that's a story in its own right, how, why it's there. Uh, there was a lot of gear that I uh, had to pack, a uh, tent, a uh, bit of a, a self-inflating mattress, uh, uh, a first aid kit, and uh, water and all sorts of other things. Not a lot of room for food, but I managed a few packets of two-minute noodles uh, and some uh, banana quick, which I kind of like, and you can just add it to the water, and it makes uh, drinking water a little bit more interesting. Just before I left, I decided that I should do it for a cause. The cause was me, but I wanted to do it for a better cause. And through my uh, big brother Bill, I was put in touch with the Deaf Blind Society. Uh, there was a member of our extended family, and they had given us great support. So I met the outing at uh, Manly, and uh, carried my pack and my gear, and they all waved me goodbye and said thanks very much for waving the flag for it. Up to uh, Port Augusta, carrying a little bit of extra weight on myself and my back. And that's uh, Spencer Golf there. I decided to have a shave uh, and make sure I was cleanly shaven for the five months journey. And I got out at uh, seven o'clock in the morning at the caravan park and I was about to head off without too much fanfare uh, across Australia on foot. And I realized that I wouldn't be able to take a photograph of the start line. Fortunately, a local walker came along and I asked him if he'd take a picture for me, so he walked me down to the water's edge and we took a picture for the, the, the start of the big adventure. The, <laughs> the whole thing started because I heard about a lady that rode a push bike across Australia. Would you believe within a few days, exactly the same group was doing another tour and, uh, and they stopped and had a chat with me, so I, I told the guy in charge there, it's all his fault that I'm out here. From that uh, first picture, uh, no, you couldn't see it. I decided to take a solar panel with me because I'm a technologist and I had 12 rechargeable batteries, uh, 24 rechargeable batteries and a 12 volt panel that was only five watts. Uh, and I was able to charge the batteries as I went along and there's a few stories about that. It didn't work first of all and I had all sorts of reasons why it didn't work. For a start, I had it on my back of my backpack and I was walking north, and as most people probably know, the sun is in the north in winter. <laughs> and so that, that got me started to put it on my front, which is where the normal photographs show it. But then it still didn't work, and so I suspected a few other things. Eventually, I was sitting down at a small town of a couple of hundred k's into the journey, and I had a multimeter with me and a pair of pliers and a few other tools. Uh, not much food, but plenty of tech -o stuff. <laughs> and I was sitting there measuring the current going between the solar panel and the batteries under charge, and there was just no, no current, no milliamps at all. So I was flexing the panel, and all of a sudden the needle, not the needle, it was a digital, wasn't it? Yes, but it started to show 100 milliamps, and that wasn't so bad after all. So I found that if I held it in a particular way, that it would work okay, but by this time it was, it and me was very distorted. So I then walk, worked my fingers along and I found that if I pressurised it just there, some sort of internal connection had come adrift. So I went into town at Quorn and I went to a general purpose hardware store in a small town and they had everything and I asked the guy if he had anything I could do and he sold me a set of three clamps for $2.50 <laughs> And I put pressure on at that point, and that followed me from then on for five months, and it, it didn't miss a beat from then on. But every time so I, somebody pulled up in a car and, uh, to have a chat and see what I was doing, they'd say, what's the clamp for? <laughs> so I had to tell the whole story again about how the solar panel didn't work. 
Uh, now for the technical people. I really didn't know what I was doing when I set out, uh, technically, from uh, a ham point of view. My intention was to stick a piece of wire in the PL235, 259, whatever, at the back of the radio and sling it over a tree and I would be on the air. That's a real good long line antenna. That'll work fine. Well, it didn't. We're talking about five watts and very inexperienced. I was trying to use a bit of Morse code and I couldn't even get my call sign out without an error on the third character. So uh, that was no good. So I spoke. I was talking to uh, my brother Bill in Newcastle by mobile phone and a friend in, in Gympie, uh, Roger, VK4BNQ, thank you Roger for all your support. And Roger sent me down some parts to make a ballon of ferrite and some wire and a diagram on how to do it. And I had enough background that I could follow the whole diagram. I went into a local uh, general purpose workshop and I asked them if they had any coax or PL259, hoping that they knew what I was talking about. And the guy went straight over to a corner that was just piled with junk, old uh, fluoro battens and coils of wire and whatever, and he, and he pulled this out, and not only was it a piece of coax, but it had the, co the connector on the other end as well, the PL259. So I twisted the wires, didn't have the ability to solder them at all, tied it all up with a Venetian corn, and then, put it on top of the rubbish bin, ran it up to a dipole for 40 metres, and I had my first Q, uh, QSL, QSL, QSL. <laughs> QSL. Uh, so I was on the air, so that was all good news. That's uh, how I set myself up at the caravan park to do my work, and this is all the sort of stuff that I was carrying in my backpack that left no room for the food, so I had my logbook, a uh, UHF radio, a camera, some, some uh, cord, tie pliers, etc, etc. So I was well equipped to do it. That's just a close up of the final job. I don't know where it ended up. Oh, that's a, that's a shot to show that. When I, when I installed the antenna of an evening, I had to be able to pull it apart again and pack it up. And so I just had um, alligator clips there to clip onto that. That's <laughs> that was the next caravan park at uh, Hawker, and I decided I better lay it all out and take a photograph. So we've got the electronic gear up the back. We've got a couple of tins of noodles here, a bit of clothing, some warm gloves because I'm expecting low temperatures, a tent, a sleeping bag, a billy. Uh, a, um, there it goes again. A first aid kit. Thank you. I heard that. Oh, and here um, is a. A 10, 10 battery holder for AA batteries in series at 1.2 volts, that made 12 volts altogether. So that's what got charged by the solar panel when it eventually had its clamp. But there was a bit of a problem with that. In, in the 10 years since then, I've found out that when you've got solar panels and batteries, you have to have a solar controller so that the solar panels don't overcharge the batteries. And you know when the batteries are getting overcharged because they overheat and cause a lot of trouble. And the trouble they caused me was that when I had the AA battery in the battery holder, the tension on the spring and the heat of that with melting the plastic or softening the plastic just pushed it apart. And so within a very short time, I was unable to use the, the uh, battery holder very well. And in the future, what I did to measure the temperature was as I walked along, I had my hand on my battery pack, and when it started to get a bit warm, I knew they're charged, so I'll put some more batteries in and start the charging process all over again. <laughs> so that's what, that's what you call the uh, battery, battery management temperature system or something like that. So a bit, bit more sophisticated, sophisticated than that in today's electric motor cars. This, uh, because I was technical, I came across this in a paddock, so I, I left the road and walked over to it. It's a solar panel out in the bush. And, oh, I thought I had it right next to that one. Okay, what they were doing years ago was solar panels like this to operate a bore pump, uh, and they had push rods and motors and all sorts of things to tilt it to follow the sun and do the whole thing. Problem is, they do break down. 
and in the outback it cost you $500 to get the tech out, and then he finds out it needs a spare part, so he goes back to Adelaide, then he comes back again later. This is so simple, and I'm starting to see them all over the place. This is a cylinder containing a, a gas, uh, a refrigerant, I'll call it, but they actually do uh, backyard jobs out of propane, which is not particularly safe. Um, and there's another one up there, and this has got a shield on it, and this has a shield on it. So when the sun's coming from this direction, it shades that one and heats that one, and it drives the liquid from there as a gas down to this end. And likewise the other way, and the extra weight is what tilts it in the afternoon. And I just thought it was an absolutely magnificent solution to a real problem. Then I came across a cattle station, and uh, fascinated with the amount of solar panels. There's another 18 uh, on the other side. And I chatted with a guy, and the government was giving very good subsidies, and this is 10 years ago, uh, to the outback stations so that they, would, they could put in solar and use less uh, diesel. And they did, he showed me all the paperwork, he did very extensive uh, uh, power audit to find out what he needed, and they put it all up and it was magnificent. And two years later, they were running the diesel as often as what they were before they had the solar, because they got used to having 24 hour power and they put in an extra freezer and a high, a bigger TV screen and all the rest of it. So be careful of what you wish for. These are the sort of signs I was coming across. So there's a, uh, the Stewart Highway that goes from Adelaide up to Darwin as it goes up near the, uh, uh, well, it's Copley. Um, there's a coal mine up there that recently closed down, Lee Creek, round about there, and there's a road that comes across here, and I finally hit the, the T-junction for that, but it did show me that Inaminka, which is kind of the middle of the trip, but the middle of nowhere, 431 to go. Uh, so these signs were always interesting to me to tell me how I was getting along. This was not too far around the corner, it's a ranger station. They let me stay there for a couple of days, they had a soldering iron, I was able to rebuild my battery pack uh, in such a way that it worked and I stayed there for a few days uh, and then I moved on and that's my new battery pack. Uh, the ground was wet in quite a few cases, I always had to get the radio up above the ground and the antenna of course went up to the nearest tree if I could find one. When I, when I left Arkarula, which is a bit of a resort there, the next part that I needed to go to, I had to come back 35 kilometres and go back up the main road. Somebody told me that there is a road that goes across there, hasn't been used for a while, and you can sort of cut across and pick the other one up, and I thought, oh, well, that'll do. Uh, and so this is the road I was following. I did have a GPS, but I also had made friends with the guy that uh, owns and runs the Arkarula Resort, and he was a pilot and an amateur radio operator. And I made arrangements with him while he was doing his morning joy flights in the air and he had UHF on, on board and I was able to tell him that I was leaving now, I'm about halfway, I've made it okay, thank you very much for the support. So I was able to keep safe and yet travel in unmarked territory. This is a, one of the original uh, mark, uh, survey marks or benchmarks that they put down in the 1800s and the map that I was carrying or parts of maps that I was carrying, they had these written there. So I would have the number 7114 on the map and I would quite often just leave the side of the road and walk over and see if I can find it. And you'd be surprised, probably one in 10 is still out there, still visible, and they put concrete, for want of a better word, around them, but just made out of local materials. Fascinating bit. Of, I, I am quite fascinated with the early surveyors. They did some great work there. Finally got up to a place called North Blinman, an old uh, copper mine town, and it was like this, uh, very wet, and I turned up absolutely, totally, and utterly soaked, no way to keep dry. And they uh, put me up at the hotel, told me to help myself to one of the rooms, and I could stay as long as I kept the rain coming down. Then on to Moolawatma Station and I bought them some rain as well and as soon as the, uh, as soon as the owner of the station uh, could see the rain coming down, he's off on his uh, motorbike and just go and see which creeks are running. They hadn't seen rain for months and months and months and years 
and this is the, uh, the governess and the uh, two children doing their school of the air. And that's me. Uh, when I left Moola Watma Station, I had a, a couple of hundred k's to go up to the Streslecki track. But the main road, called, the main road uh, called Mount Hopeless Road, uh, it was shut down. We'd got been on the radio, on the telephone actually, to, uh, to other stations around and they found out the road was closed. But there is a gas pipeline road about 10 k's over that way. And if you can find that, that'll be open because they have to keep the road open to service the gas pipeline. So I said, oh, that sounds pretty good to me. So not far into it, I had to do a bit of mud walking. Then I finally came across the road and that was my, um, that was my aiming point, was this particular part there. And this was the gas pipeline road. And that goes from Moomba, gas and oil fields down to Adelaide, and now gets across to Sydney and Melbourne as well, I think. Um, and the pipelines are so large in diameter and so long that when they want to do a shutdown of the gas uh, production site, they just stop, they pressurise the line, and there's enough capacity in the line to supply Adelaide, Melbourne and Sydney for two weeks without putting any more into it. I got to Mosquito Creek, uh, lots more rain. I had to, build a, had to build a raft to put my radio on to stop it from getting too wet. I did find a couple of trees for the antenna. Having a sleep during the night and I heard the creek running and I wasn't too happy because it's absolutely flat all around me and there was nowhere for the creek to go but up. But uh, fortunately it didn't go up too far. On the gas pipeline line, on the gas pipeline road, They've got sections of the road where they they service uh, the pipes and they have uh, sacrificial anodes to stop them corroding and that sort of thing. And they've, it's very hot out here in the summer, although I was there in winter. And this bit of a shelter is for the car to park in, not for the people that work on the site and on the equipment, but so that when they get back in the car to move on again, they can actually touch the steering wheel to do some work. It is very, very hot out there. That's one of the pumping stations, number two. Uh, lots and lots of communications. Lots of pumping, but there's nobody home. It is a fully automated station in the middle of nowhere. And they've got a helicopter pad, and they've got communications back, and everything is monitored from the uh, Moomba base. That's a lovely picture of a lonely road in outback, uh, outback South Australia. The interesting thing about that photo, it was on a slight rise, and so I took the photo and I turned around and I took the photo of where it just came from, and it's hard to tell the difference between the two photos. Finally, I finally got the Streslecki track, and there's a place there called Monte Colina Bore, and uh, it managed to have a bit of uh, water there, a uh, big sign on it that said, don't drink the water. That didn't make me very happy because it was a, a organised watering point for me. But I did manage to set my antenna up between the sand hill and the top of the building. And I stayed there for a few days. So that, that, was, a, that was a good place to stay. The, the main road, the Streslecki track, which is the support road for Moomba gas and oil fields. And there's normally trucks going along, along this road like every 10 minutes there's another truck with supplies or taking stuff out or whatever. And the company monitors the road to see what condition it's in, what they need in the way of uh, graders and bulldozers, etc., to repair it. And the helicopter went past and seen, saw me walking on the road. And so he landed and he came around and he said, you all right, mate? I said, yeah, fine, thanks very much. So I put, I, I, I put the camera into uh, video mode and I took a picture of him as he, as he took off and left. And that was very nice of him to look after me. That's just a shot of how bad the condition of the road was uh, and it was closed for about two weeks. Mind you, in two weeks, I didn't go very far anyway, so. Uh, <laughs> when I was at the uh, Moomba oil fields, I had the opportunity to do some repairs because I had some broken wires by that time. And that's one of my favourite shots. It's the story of the outback, you put the billy on the fire. And it was just one of my favourite photographs. Doesn't mean anything other than that. 
when the when the road was eventually opened, uh, one of the uh, one of the convoys that came past, one of the, the groups of people came past, was this fellow John John's Tours, and he had all of the tag alongs people that were prepared to drive across the outback but didn't want to do it on their own, and so he would do a tag along tour. And so he stopped to see what I was doing, and everyone else got out to see what I was doing, and out came the cameras, and over came a cup of tea and a bunch of grapes, and so we ended up staying on the side of the road there for half an hour or so. And just out of interest, uh, four years after that, I was asked to do a east-west crossing, this was south-north, and would you believe John's tours came past while I was walking <laughs> in the middle of the great Victorian desert, nowheresville. A bit further up, I had another uh, choice to make. I had 12 kilometres to go to a turn-off that came back, another 12 kilometres to Murty Murty Station. And uh, the, my uh, choice, my alternative was to do a, a cross there. So I set up the radio, I spoke to my brother, told him what I was doing, and I had a, H, a UHF uh, channel for the, that I knew for Murty Murty Station, so off I went. Not thinking that in between each of the sand hills there's puddles. <laughs> And I would come over the top of a sand, sand hill if I had to walk this way 500 metres to get around the edge of it to come back online again. So that, that was an interesting excursion and that'll give you an idea of the, uh, the water that was lying around. This is a cattle station, but they're, uh, they're entrepreneurial people. So every time a mining company left their camp, they would go and scavenge all of the equipment. And that stuff like, you know, uh, switchboards and old tyres and wheels and just miles and miles just dumped out in the, in the back of the back paddock. And back on the main road again and into the uh, Moomba gas and oil fields and the flying doctor guy was there so he decided to check me out, declared me fit and well. Uh, and they looked after me, put me in a VIP room uh, for three or four days and I gave a talk at their auditorium to the fellows there. I put my antenna up and I left it up for four days rather than take it down every night, so I did the right thing and hung a bit of flag on it. And then off I went again, heading now for Inaminka, 95 kilometres uh, further up the road. Inaminka's about halfway. I suppose I better uh, make a move. What I found was when I did the repair, <laughs> geez, you didn't hear me say this, I got the polarity wrong. <laughs> So the first day out, I discharged the batteries via the solar panel. I did work out what it was, and so I just twisted the wires. So the lovely job I did, they gave me the connectors to put on there. It was all beautiful, but it was wrong. Uh, you might have heard of the ge geothermal work going on in the middle of uh, South Australia, in the middle of Australia, and they go down 3,000 metres, and they pump cold water down, and they get hot water back, and they generate electricity. And that's where it is, that's uh, the geothermal place. They got one, one rig was broken and they had to wait till they got another one, $400,000, thank you very much. A lot of money got into it and they finally got some electricity being generated and they went into Inaminka, official population 16, and they said, uh, look, we can give you some power, we want to just sort of generate it and see how it works, what have you. And would you believe the 16 official population at in a minka who used to generate or still generate all their own power could not make a decision to accept the free power. <laughs> and so they didn't have free power, they still argued amongst themselves every day and these guys had nowhere to sell their power. The nearest place that they were really lined up to sell was 400 kilometres away, but it was a good idea to generate electricity out here in the middle of nowhere with somebody else's money. I was trying to determine today what the optimum height is for a 40 metre dipole. Somebody might be able to tell me it's a quarter wavelength or half a wavelength or whatever. But I wasn't always able to achieve that and so quite often the antenna was lower than the microphone. I did have the advantage of the top of a sign on the side of the road. I don't know what they expected me to do about a dip, there's just no traffic or anything on the road. And the other end of it was a nice heavy rock. And then, of course, the, uh, the uh, ballon was uh, around about the height of my knees. Finally got to Inaminka, looking like the well-dressed gentleman that I am. Still got my clamp, of course. 
and uh, the folks were there taking pictures of this strange thing that came in the desert. So I said, here, have my camera take one of me, please. I wish I hadn't said that. It's, <laughs> it's not the most glamorous that I've ever looked. Oh, there's the other one. This is a mechanical, electronic, uh, tracking solar panel, uh, and it doesn't work. So it's wrong, it's, it's the correct part of the day and the rest of the time it doesn't work, and it costs so much to get somebody up to service it that they just don't service it. So they're better off just putting their panels flat and putting a, a few extra panels up. When I was at Inaminka, I was looked after very well by Jeff and Julie Matthews, and I had a uh, nice little spot there to put my camp, and I found somewhere to put my antenna up. I stayed there for about a week. While I was there, Peter runs a cruise on the Cooper Creek, and uh, he had some work for me to do. He, th he started off by saying, I'll take you for a free cruise tomorrow if you like. I said, oh, thank you very much, Peter. He said, oh, by the way, would you have a look at this alternator for me, please? <laughs> So out came all the tools and the alternators and we sat there. Anyway, it was a very nice cruise the next day and Cooper Creek is really something. It's in the middle of nowhere, always water and millions of, of bird life, pelicans, the whole lot. And also the, uh, the bash was coming through in Aminka at the time. And so they were there for the night uh, and then they're off again the next day. And then I was off again the next day as well. So. Uh, Jeff and Julie too at the countryside in their six wheel Oka, yes Oka, and they finally decided it was time to settle down and they settled down in Inaminka and they sort of just about doubled the population by stopping there for a while. Lovely horses uh, just after I left Inaminka, they were on the side of the road and they just decided to follow me for a while. I did find a few trees, well what used to be trees, to, uh, to put the antenna up on. It's nice to get a bit of height from time to time to do that. And the occasional water hole, always nice to come across that. This is the main road called the Cadillo Downs Road. It goes from Inaminka, 414 kilometres to Birdsville. And there's a gate right across the middle of it. And it said no camping in the homestead paddocks for the next 15 kilometres. So that's the southern gate to Cadillo Downs. And you open the gate and go through and and you get to Cadillo Downs. Cadillo Downs has got one of the biggest wool sheds, uh, not no longer in use, uh, 36 stands, I think it was. And I went in there and I just asked if I could get some water and they said, oh, look, come and tell us what you're doing. And about a week later, I managed to get away. <laughs> they put me up in the, uh, in the, uh, re in the what do they call the cowboy's quarters. This she was quarters, yeah, but the, the roustabout type shoes, yeah, the, not really shoes, just the, the workers. Anyway, so they put me up there, that was fine, I stayed there for a week. And one of the things that they got me to do was to have a look at their gen sets. They're 44 uh, KVA gen sets, and they've got two of them, of course, for, to go from one to the other. One of them would start, uh, but not produce any electricity, and the other one wouldn't start. So they had to start it by hand and then switch it over and do all sorts of things, so in the end, I did determine that one of the relays was uh, definitely not working, one of the contactors in that, and uh, the guy was happy to ring his supplier, his electrical guy, and he agreed, and he was also happy that the owner of the property could change the, uh, that, the uh, contactor, so that was fine. And the other one that wouldn't start automatically from back at the homestead, they had to get up at six o'clock in the morning in the middle of winter and go and start it there, so I did sort that out. That was just a wiring problem. So they were happy to see me there for a week. And when I left, they gave me a bag of oranges and et cetera, et cetera. And then it was back on the road. <laughs> so you see this sort of thing quite often out there where something breaks down and the cost to repair it or retrieve it is just too great so it gets left there. And that's the road that's going out of uh, the top end of South Australia, about to cross the Queensland border. At the top end of Cadillo's Down Station, which is 80 kilometres from the homestead, they, I stopped there, I knew they were there working out there, and uh, they said, uh, stay overnight, join us, uh, join us for a, a stew. And in the morning they said, oh, you might as well have a shower if you like. So we're talking three, four, five degrees. And they got the windshield on the, on the shower, a 44 gallon drum with water, a gas system out of a caravan, and a gas bottle, and a dribble of warm water. And you're actually better off without the shower, let me tell you. <laughs> And that gives you some idea of the temperature. 
They're sitting around the fire at the late, late afternoon, might have been early morning, now come to think of it, but they're just rugged up and it's bloody freezing out there. And I had a shower. <laughs> and a couple of nights later, I noticed that my uh, tent uh, fly, my tent, uh, tent proper, uh, actually lost the zipper. And the zipper was the only thing between me and snakes and scorpions and spiders. So once I zipped that up for night, I was happy. I'm protected, but it wasn't. So I got on the radio and my big brother Bill organised the, rang the company I bought it all from. They were very good. They not only supplied it free, but they freighted it out to Birdsville for me. And I picked it up uh, just a week or so later. Another uh, fortuitous place to start the antenna. And then finally, a, uh, in, into, uh, into Queensland and the Birdsville Road, east-west road to, into Birdsville. <laughs> uh, I started to catch some uh, bitumen here and some of the places across the Nullarbor and certainly up here, they designate part of the road as an emergency airstrip for the Flying Doctor. And so this is actually an airstrip as well as a bit of a road and then it goes back to being dirt again on the other side. That's my last night before I got into Birdsville and the interesting thing about that night was that uh, I heard a dingo howling about seven o'clock in the evening. I assume it was a dingo. Uh, and then it stopped and then it started again but it had moved across about 90 degrees out to the east, say. So you thought, hmm. So then it stopped, so I made sure I had plenty of wood and I kept the fire going and I had a few stones lined up at the front of the tent. And I was quite prepared to defend myself if it did come to that, but I, I really did think it would be more frightened of me than I was of it. But then it went further around, another 90 degrees, and howled again for a while and then finally it gave up after three or four hours. When I'm in at Birdsville the next night sitting around the campfire, my next door sitter, neighbour, was the local ranger, indigenous fellow. We're having a really good uh, chat. And he said, how's it been? I said, yeah, pretty good. Any dingoes out there? I said, yeah, I had one last night. He says, oh, I was calling up its mates. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> I wouldn't have been happy to have had three or four of them there. Now, in at Bird's Ball, I thought you guys would appreciate this photo. Uh, and a couple following. There's some old gear there. Uh, I think that's an old, oh, it is a Traeger, it says so. Well, there's a couple of old Traegers. Um, and, and they've kept them all and, and they've, they've uh, done a good job of, um, of having a sort of a museum without it being super elaborate. Old um, switchboard, trying to think of a fellow that invented that. He's an Englishman, we used to know him well. So they've, uh, oh there's a, that's an early codan. Yeah, some great stuff, great history out there. And of course, I had to take a picture of the Birdsville Races starting gate, so that's just to say I've been there. I, I, was, I missed it all. Now, while I was at Birdsville, I caught up with John Bear. He was uh, most disappointed. He had heard that I was on the way, just on the uh, grapevine, and his codan uh, was away getting some frequencies changed or fitted or repaired. Uh, but he managed to have a, a couple, of, uh, couple of chats there on, on my gear. And then his finally turned up uh, a week or so later and he was able to continue then to talk to me on the, on the track. As I was leaving Birdsville, I realised they didn't have a photo of me arriving at Birdsville, so I staged a shot. Put the antenna up one night and when I got up in the morning, covered in cobwebs, overnight. So that was kind of interesting. That's a water hole I didn't drink out of. I did have a billy so I could boil water and of course it, it, you're better off with boiled dirty water than dying so that's always an option. I also had some water purification tablets. I did use them once, not to purify the water but just to see what it was like to do that and certainly not that water and it tasted horrible and I sort of thought mm, maybe you'd be better off dying than bloody <laughs> water purification tablets. So that's the, that's the kitchen, it's a billy. Uh, dual purpose, it does coffee or two minute noodles. Uh, a spoon, the only eating utensil I carried with me. And water is heavy. Uh, and when you do your noodles in the water, of course you get the water, that's good news. But when you do the washing up, you spill a bit of water without any soap and then you drink the wash up water because otherwise you throw it away. 
but it's still good water. Uh, this is a little town in Benuri, a, a bit of a uh, bit of luxury here. I had a chair. One of the things you miss when you're hiking is that you haven't got a chair, uh, and it's interesting. But I also had a oh, nice tall, I think that was the tallest I ever got the antenna up. <laughs> what was interesting here was that I went into the local tourist bureau and I was talking to the guy behind the counter, and he says, hmm, just a sec, and he picked up the phone. He said, uh, Robbie, Robbie Dare would like to talk to you. I said, oh, yeah, here's Robbie Dare. So he said, down the road there at the caravan park. So I went down. And Robbie Dare is the mayor of the Diamantina Shire. He owns the caravan park and the petrol station and the general store. And he, I got ushered into his office and he's directing just about the Olympic Games. He's got people running all around the place doing stuff and he's telling them all. He says, sit down, sit down, tell me your story. So I started to tell him the story. He said, where are you staying tonight? I said, I saw some grass as I came into town. He said, no, nah, no, nah, that's not good enough. So he picked up the phone. And a lady came in and they handed me a key. They said, you can stay in room number seven. So why am I telling you the story? It was the seventh day of July, the seventh month in 2007. <laughs> so I thought I'd better tell that story. Also in Baduri, they had a government grant and they built a really, really good sports centre. I've got lots of good shots of it, squash courts and all sorts of things. And when I got there, there was a couple of personal trainers and I was wandering around and they said, what are you doing? I told them what I was doing. They said, oh, come in, we'll check you out. So I went and I got checked out. I was 66 at the time and I had the metabolism of a 38-year-old. So if you want to get fit, just go and walk 30 k's every day with a 30 k pack on the back. Also, I did a rebuild of the antenna <laughs> and I did a much better job. I had a few days. Would you believe I tried I, I sought out and, and found some uh, stainless steel trace that's used for fishing lines. Multi-stranded stainless steel, I thought, that's the way to go. If I, it would not work. It would not transmit, it wouldn't receive, wouldn't do anything. I put the old piece of old copper wire back on, it worked straight away. I haven't been able to find out, there's a conundrum for our low frequency man, wide wooden stranded stainless steel wire transmit and receive. Pardon? <laughs> no, it, it, well, I didn't strip the plastic off, but I should have, you're saying. Oh, I don't know about that. Oh, okay. Did I push the button? Yeah, I did. Uh, I got to build your camel races, and the uh, local radio station was making announcements. I got on very well with the local radio announcer. Slight difference in our ages, about two generations. And my shoes got a clean up as well. They were just the one pair of shoes for the whole walk. In fact, I still wear the same brand, Brooks. Uh, I did ask, uh, well, our, my organisers and myself tried to get a big donation out of Brooks and they gave us one pair of shoes. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. So that's the tallest my antenna ever got. That was uh, Corella Creek. That was one of uh, Burke and Will's monuments there to say they went past there. So I was able to string that up over quite a height and uh, got good reception that day. That's a picture I don't like to show, but uh, that's at Cloncurry, uh, about 400 kilometres from the end of the road. But it shows I've lost quite a bit of weight. In fact, I lost about 15 kilos in three, three or four months. And I had to stop from time to time and eat lots of ice cream and chocolates, which I hated doing, uh, just to put some fuel back in the tank, ready to, to move on again. I, I got down to 76 kilos, and currently I stand at 86. And so 76 was a bit too light. And that's the Quamby Hotel. My very faithful Billy that had been with me all this time got left behind. And I was only about 10 k's out of Quamby. I realised I'd left it there, but I only had 300 or so k's to go and I thought, oh, that'll do. And then about an hour later, a car pulled up and said, is this your Billy? <laughs> <laughs> so I got back again. That's, that's a nice photograph, and it's not upside down. That's a, a, that's a uh, photograph of a reflection in a creek. One of my favourite photographs. And then uh, finally, of course, getting closer, 269 at Karumba. Ah, does anybody recognise the photo? Peter that's correct. Yes, Peter from, uh, from Newcastle, from Westlakes. Uh, he was talking to me from time to time, and he was 
going from Cloncurry to somewhere and he figured that I would be about there so they drove 120 kilometres uh, to just say hello and turned around and went back and got on their own again. So Peter's, uh, Peter's a great stalwart for a variety of bashes, etc. Uh, Big Brother Bill. Oh, there is a story behind the car, but I think we're running out of time, so I won't tell the full story of the car, but Bill drove it up from Newcastle up to uh, meet me at... Not Cloncurry, next one up, Normanton. The idea that he would uh, day step with me going the last 70 kilometres and then he'd pick me up and take me home. So we set up at the caravan park. I was in my tent, Bill was sitting there, the car's sitting there. And I got up to the middle of the night, go for a pee, and I came back and there was no car. I said, Bill, where's the car? He said, what do you mean? I said, where's the car? And he turned over and there's no car there. The car had been stolen. A local youth had got under his pillow and taken the keys, pushed the car back and drove off. Fortunately, fortunately, this is only uh, 10 minutes or so just by chance and they left so we rang the police straight away and they turned up and we told them the story and just as we were telling the story and they were about to leave, we heard the, uh, somebody doing donuts in the street out the front and sure enough it was my Holden. And so the, the cops chased them up the road. They got, uh, they were in a Land Rover, uh, but they got far enough. Oh, that's what happened. The engine is such that if you push it too hard and it gets too hot, it starts to shut down a few cylinders. Uh, and that allowed, and they had it up to about 170 k's, according to them. They kept pushing the speed thing there until it just stopped beeping when they got to the, the, the whatever it's a speed thing. Right? Uh, so the cops eventually came up quite close to them, so they abandoned the car and, and ran off into the bush. But when they abandoned it, they left it in gear, and then it just went up the road a little bit and under a wire fence. So when we got it back, one of the, one of the police drove it back, the other one drove the police car, but it's got all sorts of uh, barbed wire scratch marks going across it from time to time. So, so that was a lot of fun. And then uh, Brother Bill decided that uh, if it's good enough for me to have two minute noodles out of a billy, then he can do it as well. So that was, uh, that was his contribution to, to uh, roughing it, for putting up with it. And then welcome to Karumba. Uh, after we got to Karumba, I had been talking to Lynn Battle over on Swears Island, uh, VK2, uh, VK4 SWE. And Lynn invited Bill and I over to the resort island. Uh, and we said, yep, great, thank you very much. And we rang the local air charter people and they told us how much it was. So we rang Lynn and said, thank you very much, Lynn, but we can't afford that. And next thing we know, the air charter people ringing us up and say, be there at 7 o'clock in the morning, it's all looked after. <laughs> so that was nice. So we went over and we had a night over there and we're still friends with Lynn and Tex Battle. Uh, it's a great place. And that's what every sunset on the Gulf of Carpentaria looks like. It's just a beautiful, beautiful place. Yes, you agree, you've been there. Uh, and that was uh, wetting the feet in the water at the Gulf. Uh, I've just put my website up there. Anybody would like a copy of the book in PDF form, they can get it from up there, it's free. Uh, and uh, we were put up for a week at the motel there at Karumba. That's it. Thank you very much. On behalf of the WIA and the uh, Gold Coast Amateur Radio Society, thank you, Jeff, for telling that tale. That is amazing. Okay, and I also meant and to thank... It's amazing. <laughs> right at the beginning, I meant to thank Aidan and, and Mark uh, for inviting me to do this talk because it's a 10 year old story now but fortunately not many people walk across Australia with a ham radio and so I'm still up there and I can tell the story afresh. <laughs> Thank you.